Let's bring in Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor and legal correspondent for Slate. She also hosts the Amicus podcast. And Charles Coleman, civil rights attorney and former prosecutor in Brooklyn, New York. Both are MSNBC analysts. Thank you for joining me this evening. Dahlia, let me start with you. Judge Jackson will be the first justice with experience as a public defender. How do you think that will impact her approach to cases on the Supreme Court? I think it's so clear, not just that she's been a public defender, not just that she was a sentencing judge on a trial court, that her understanding of the criminal justice system, of the wheels of justice and how they operate, particularly for people who are poor, who are disadvantaged, she, throughout these three days, has been so deft at both explaining why it works the way it does and explaining how she explains the system to people who feel that they're carved out of it. Some of the most profound statements she made this week were about how important it is, even when you're sentencing a drug offender, to have them buy into the system so they can be rehabilitated. It's so profoundly important to hear from somebody who really believes that the system is legitimate, even for the poorest of the poor, and who struggles to help them accept that so that they can rehabilitate yeah. their lives. And Charles, I want to play to you one of the highlights from these hearings this week, Senator Cory Booker speaking yesterday. When that final vote happens and you ascend onto the onto the highest court in the land, I'm going to rejoice. And I'm going to tell you right now, the greatest country in the world, the United States of America, will be better because of you. Thank you. What was your reaction, Charles, to that moment? Well, I think that was a very important moment because it summed up, in many respects, some of the angst and anxiety and frustration that so many people who have been observing and watching the hearings the entire week have felt. Now, it's important to understand that this was very triggering for a large segment of the community, particularly for Black people. And it's not just because Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson is a Black woman. Yes, that had part of what was to do with it. But the level of political grandstanding that took place from Republicans who were asking questions that had nothing to do with the actual legal qualifications or judicial philosophy or ideology of Judge Brown Jackson is akin to the type of gaslighting and provocation and bullying that so many people experience in spaces where they do not feel like they have power and people who have privilege exert over them. And so when Senator Booker had that moment and reaffirmed our confidence and our belief in Judge Brown Jackson, it was a moment that all of us could sit and nod and agree with and applaud because for the entire week, we have watched this woman be bullied. We've watched her be interrupted. We've watched her deal with questions that border on the absurd just because people were in positions where they could do that. And so many of us could identify with that, which is why when Senator Booker spoke out in the way that we did, so many people were applauding. And Charles, in a recent opinion piece about Judge Jackson's nomination, you wrote, and I quote, lost in this overall conversation is black women's intellectual labor, which has been weaponized for political warfare. Unpack what you mean by that for our viewers, and how would you refocus the conversation about Judge Jackson's confirmation? Well, what we saw from the from the right in a lot of cases, Medi, were questions that would not have been asked of Judge Brown Jackson were it not for the fact that she is a black woman. We saw framings of yes. questions around the three-fifth compromise. We saw an inordinate amount of emphasis being placed on the notion of critical race theory and other sort of things that had nothing to do with the responsibilities of a justice on the Supreme Court. That is all in an attempt to weaponize a black woman's identity in the public in a way for political expediency. And that takes away from the legitimacy of this very important and noteworthy accomplishment. As your matrix pointed out, when you looked at the demographics and the history of the court, this is a monumental occurrence. And the fact yes. that certain people have chosen to use this as a means of trying to garner political points on either side through strictly identity without really a substantive examination of what Ms. Uh, uh, Brown Jackson actually stands for is abhorrent because there's so much substance to dig into and so many qualifications that should be applauded. 
Well said. Uh, Dahlia, you wrote a piece for Slate accusing Senate Democrats of deserting Jackson uh, during her contentious questioning, perhaps with the exception of Senator Booker. Uh, I agree with you. I think there's many things that they could have said and done that they didn't. What would you have liked to have seen Democrats do this week that they didn't? I think what you just heard, uh, I think to, to show Judge Jackson that she's seen, that she's heard, that she belongs at that table, I think that there was a real tendency to think that you could substitute saying, Judge Jackson, your family's beautiful. Judge Jackson, your children are beautiful. Your parents must yeah. be so proud for doing something that really looked like this is appalling. Senator Graham, you can't talk to her that way. And I think that you have that senatorial reliance on, I adore the members across the aisle, we're close friends, we disagree on a few policies. While you're watching what looks like a mugging happen, it just felt absolutely disproportionate and incommensurate to the insult that this, senator, that this judge was experiencing. Yeah, indeed. And I'm glad we saw some passion and energy and anger from uh, Cory Booker yesterday, because, it, as you say, it's not enough for uh, Patrick Leahy to just go out and say, this is really bad. I've never seen anything like this. Like, this is, you think, you've got to do more than that. Uh, Charles, Lindsey Graham, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, they all tried to smear Judge Jackson's character and record. At times, it was difficult to watch, to be honest. Uh, but as my colleague uh, Chris Hayes pointed out on Twitter, because of the court's conservative majority, this fight is on paper, at least, relatively low stakes. How cruel, how crazy do you think Republicans would have been if Judge Jackson's confirmation would have actually changed the court's makeup if it had been part of a 5-4 majority vote? The level of, of tactics that we have seen in terms of gamesmanship would have gone through the roof. We saw this really false attempt by Cotton and, uh, and a bit by Pauly as well to sort of paint this picture where Judge Jackson Brown, Brown Jackson wouldn't be considered serious on crime, uh, would be considered uh, uh, sympathetic the pedophiles, all of those things would have been multiplied to a greater degree if there were more at stake. But I want the public to consider something. I've been talking about the fact that if you contrast this, this confirmation hearing with that of Brett Kavanaugh, what you're looking at is a tale of two confirmations. In as much as, can you imagine what the conversation would be from the United States senators if she had behaved in her confirmation hearing with the same level of disdain, indignation, oh, and yes. entitlement that Brett Kavanaugh did when he was being questioned about legitimate allegations of sexual assault against him. There oh, would yes. be no conversation. And so I think that that all warrants consideration when we unpack what we have seen this week and really warrants a deeper interrogation of the entire process here. Yeah, we played to our viewers just a couple of nights ago Kavanaugh's famous exchanges around beer and blackouts and the, and the Clintons and compared that to Judge Jackson's restraint uh, when pushed by the likes of Ted Cruz. In fact, Dahlia, I want to get your reaction to some sound from yesterday as well. Here's Senator Ben Sass. Have a listen. I think we should recognize that the jackassery we often see around here um, is partly because of people mugging for short-term uh, camera opportunities. And it is definitely um, a second and third and fourth order effect that the court should think through um, before it has advocates in there who are not only trying to persuade you nine justices, um, but also trying to get on cable that night uh, or create a viral video. Not only is Ted Cruz sitting there listening as Ben Sass talks basically about him. The LA Times, a photographer from the Times, snapped this photo uh, of Ted Cruz searching for his own name on Twitter, uh, which is quite the combination of sound and image, don't you think? It tells you everything really you need to know about what these hearings are. They were not substantive hearings looking at the qualifications of a justice. They were moments for Republican senators who want to run for president to try and go viral with their base. Uh, definitely, you got the sense time and again that for some of these senators, this hearing was getting in the way of their campaign ad, um, you know, that they were really just desperate to make their <laughs> campaign bid for either the midterms or their run for the presidency. And this hearing was kind of getting in the way. But I just want to say that Ben Sass, uh, you know, while he, he says things like that, he consistently votes the wrong way. And so in yes. a very, very strange yes. way, this attempt to distance himself well, in the end, just doing what they do, I'm not sure it gets him quite, quite the gold star that he was aspiring to. In, 
Indeed, Ben Sass is the senator who famously shut down his personal Twitter account critical of Trump in order to get Trump's endorsement for his re-election. Let's not forget that. Charles, what one moment stood out to you over the course of this past week? If you had to pick one moment since Monday from the Senate confirmation, what would stick out in your mind? You know, I really have had a difficult time trying to isolate any particular moment, but I think that without taking away from her brilliant, unflappable, and very poised nature, uh, what we saw yesterday from Senator Booker was just such a very nice ending to a tumultuous week that was full of tension and political grandstanding. And so what I appreciated in that moment was someone from the body who spoke up and spoke authentically and sincerely about what this was really about and what this moment really meant. I mean, there's not enough that can be said about how this woman has handled herself in the face of such unspeakable absurdity throughout the course of this week. Um, and so I don't want that to be overshadowed by Senator Booker. Yes. But I think that with him being a member of the body, to speak out in that way uh, after all that we had seen was such a very important and powerful moment. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.